In many places around the world, people still do not have access to God's word. What would it be like to be part of a church and not have a copy of the Bible for yourself? Even worse, what would it be like to be a pastor and not have a copy of God's word? Tony, it's good to see you again. Uh, the last time I would have seen you in person was over in West Africa about a month ago. Uh, and here we are in, in Pennsylvania, pretty different setting than it where is. we were before. <laughs> um, so, yeah, do you want to take just a minute, uh, introduce yourself and explain why were we over in West Africa together and why that's relevant to our audience today? Yeah, well, it's good to see you again. We didn't really know each other that much before we went and spent some time hanging out there and enjoying a tad warmer weather, even though it's actually warm today compared to what it was last week. Um, but yeah, I'm Anthony Heim. I am the executive director of Heralds of Hope from Breezewood, Pennsylvania. And we were in West Africa in Guinea-Bissau and Senegal for the purpose of following up with a container load of Bibles that we shipped in. Mm -hmm. um, we shipped them there and we wanted to go along, kind of follow up, see how they're being distributed, uh, it was kind of a relationship building expedition. We wanted to build a relationship with the organization that we went through, but also the people on the ground mm. that we're going to do the distributing. Just be able to to relate with them, learn to know them, for them to know us, and be able to communicate what our expectations were mm. as far as distributing Bibles. So I'm, I'm curious about that because when you had, you had first reached out to me about this this trip and – I was like, okay, Bibles in West Africa, that sounds fine, but like, can't they, they get these things? Like, what? so what is this? Is this an issue of availability? Like, why were you guys sending over a container load of Bibles to West Africa? So it's a kind of a multi, there's a mul multiple problems with it. First of all, there's an expense issue. So for someone there, especially that country, they told us it takes about two and a half days for them to earn enough of money to buy a Bible. So I don't know what, your salary is and what it would take, how many, what you could buy after two and a half days of work. But that would be kind of part of it. So it's definitely an expensive purchase mm. for them. So like for our equivalency, maybe a few hundred dollars yeah. or something. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So very, like very expensive. Right. And that was actually a better ratio than some places we've heard. I mean, it, it ranges from um, a season's crops in one part of Kenya, they were telling us. Whoa. Uh, so this, this farmer... Uh, obviously a poor farmer, uh, if he would buy a Bible, that would be a season's worth of crops for him. Now, he might have more than one crop in a season, but you can get the picture. It's, you know, That's... half year's wages <laughs> is what it would be for him to have the money to go buy a Bible. So that's part of the issue. But this particular situation was slightly different. Uh, they struggled to get access to them. The Bibles that they wanted were a Portuguese Creole. It's not Portuguese and it's... You know, we think of Creole and maybe from Haiti, where that's mm -hmm. a French Creole, but this is a Portuguese Creole, and they wanted to get that language. And it's actually hard. It was hard for them to get it. There was a, a time when I think the Bible Society in Brazil had printed some for them, but that was it was they were far and few in between. And the Bible Society there in Guinea-Bissau had actually lost their rights at one point and couldn't print them. And so they got them back and everything. But we heard about this need and we said, well, that would fit into our vision. That fits into our wheelhouse. And so uh, one of our staff, one of our, the fellow who takes care of that, he went and researched it. We talked to Biblica and we're actually able to get a container load printed and sent to them. Mm -hmm. So we were kind of filling two needs. First of all, an accessibility need where they just simply were not available. Mm -hmm. uh, we, when we were there then, we did learn that, yes, they had some available, but not very many. And again, they were back to being expensive. Mm -hmm. So we were hitting kind of two birds with one stone where... Mm -hmm. A, a cost issue, but also an availability. Mm. So that grabbed my heart a little quicker than just here. These are cheap Bibles or free Bibles. It was, it was, you can't get them because yeah. it's just, they're hard to find. Mm. Here's, we're meeting a need mm. in more ways than one. I, I had to think about, um, I think that the last day that I was there, 
we went pretty deep into the bush uh, to a church there. That was, was fantastic. You know, they all come in. It was, it was like a Tuesday afternoon, you know, so it wasn't really like a Sunday morning service, but they came in for a special service and um, and the pastor, you know, was like, hey, here, here's Bibles for this church. And they were just so excited. And when we were leaving, I asked the pastor, I said, well, okay, this church has been here a while. And how long have some of these people been waiting for a Bible? And he said, oh, there was definitely people there that hadn't had one since they became Christians 10 years ago. I was like, mm. they waited 10 years to get a Bible? Mm -hmm. He's like, yeah, they, they've never had their own copy. Um, that really surprised me. And I think that's one of the things with, from what I understand you all as, a, as an organization and different church groups are trying to hone in on that need of saying there are many places around the world where there's there's a real shortage, a real Bible shortage. Yeah. Is is that a fair way of saying that's that's part of what you all do as, as a ministry? Yeah, yeah. And you know, we've had some discussion on vision and where we want to go with this. Our actual Bible distribution part of our organization has overtaken broadcasting and overtaken everything else we do. And so the question was, do we continue down that road? What does that look like? Mm -hmm. um, and the, the direction we're getting from the board is, yes, but let's do it effectively mm -hmm. and and not not let off in the other things that we're doing. Yeah. So yeah. we're not going to get necessarily go dive in whole hog mm -hmm. because we've we've learned that yes, you can throw a lot of money at this problem, but you need to actually be a little more patient to do it effectively. Hmm. What unpack that a little bit when you say more patient, <laughs> like I, I guess there there's um some sensitivities around this this topic, mm -hmm. which is actually one of the reasons I wanted to do this podcast. When you first messaged me and said, hey, we're going to West Africa to take Bibles in, I was just like, mm, you know, I've kind of heard that before. And it's like, is this really like, is this the real deal? Because there have been, you know, cases um, all, all across, you know, in missions where, you know, maybe it was overhyped or it ended up not even working out and things like that. And then when we actually got there and we started talking to these pastors and, and working with the local churches there and things, it was like, oh, okay, this is a real need. This mm -hmm. isn't like an issue of persecution or what, it's just an access issue. Like we just need to figure out a way to ship them in basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that felt like that was a little different to me. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure entirely where I'm going with that, but I I, I think that's one of the reasons to have these, these kinds of conversations, yeah. you know? Uh, yeah, so, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, yeah so I, I'll... I'll get into the weeds a little bit with that. So this one, I felt worked out really well. We've had instances where it did not work out well. And we, <laughs> oh no! <laughs> we had we had a situation where we were getting contacted from a lot of pastors in Zambia, and we were we were interacting with them. It seemed good. We try not to send money direct to anybody, mm. and so we bought some Bibles from the the Bible Society and distributed to them. Like we bought direct from the Bible Society and left the pastor have them. And then they said, well, there's this bookstore that they're cheaper. Well, okay, they're cheaper. Let's get some. Hmm. And so we did that for a while until we thought there's quite a bit going on here. It's time to pay a visit. And we went to like, we're going to come visit you. And they're like, oh, it's so far back in. Nobody comes out here. And we're like, hmm. wait a minute. And then we pushed a little farther, like, we think we can get there. And they're like, well, we're actually going to be gone for uh, Feast of Tabernacles, I think it was. And we're like, wait, what? <laughs> hmm. Like, who do, you know, why do you do that? Okay, well, that's a different subject. But really, they didn't want us to come. Hmm. And so then that kind of put the flags up. And there was some other contacts we had in the area. And they went looking for this bookstore. And it doesn't exist, best we can tell. Hmm. Now, there were some questions about the Bible Society on top of it. After hmm. they visited, some of our staff visited the Bible Society, and there was some questions after that as well. So we think some of our funds went for Bibles, but we're not, we're pretty sure that not hmm. all of them did. Like, so there's some questions there. And so that, what we were doing there, we just stopped. We changed who we're working with. And and I guess for be lack of better terms, we're moving on. Mm -hmm. But it was a, it was an expensive education. Mm -hmm. um, there are other partners that we've been working with. We're pretty comfortable and confident. But again, we're realizing we need to go visit them, and we yeah. need to build that relationship. Hmm. 
So yeah, yeah, expensive lessons. This particular case, I was really excited about and really happy with what I found. Hmm. When we got there and the organization that we were dealing with, I was watching how they handled it. And there was this, this combination of the one guy, he was, they were really tight with him. Like you had to be a believer and you had to know how to read. That was the only way you were going to get one. And then the other guy was a little more open with it. And he's like, you know, he was, he seemed a little more free with it, but there was another discussion going on in the back. The one who was tighter with it also wanted to sell some to raise money, to fix some vehicles and some needs that the organization had. And the other one, ah. Pastor M, it was Pastor D and Pastor M. So M was, he was more like, yeah, we should just keep them free. We don't want to get into money. Uh, we should make sure they're available. But he was, I, when I watched him on Sunday, like you guys weren't there. Mm. But what I watched happen on Sunday, he was a little more open-handed with it. Mm. But he was pretty sure that, you know, we, we're giving them away free. We're mm. not going to get any money out of it. So just my observation, I'm like, well, as long as they're, they're butting heads a little bit, I think we're in good shape. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if they'll ever listen to this, but it's just like, yeah, I think if if they're just, you know, they're a team, they're working together, they have a little mm -hmm. disagreement. We clearly told them these, this load is not for sale. Mm -hmm. And we went with that. I, I'm not opposed to making some sort of deal work like that, where they could use them, sell them for a modest sum to like they, that's what they did when they built their radio station. They had a load of Bibles come in and they sold them mm. for a small amount to raise funds for that station. So that's kind of how that came about. Interesting. At least in part. Huh. So, so as we think of getting involved with something like this, say, you mm -hmm. know, in this particular, okay, let's use this, this case. In missions, there's this, um, there's the real danger of it coming across as here's the great Americans or the Westerners or the white people coming in and, and fixing all the problems and giving out all the, the resources and things. Um, this taint of colonialism, yeah. I think, is a, is a good way of saying it. And it's, you know, well, we've, we've both been involved in different ministry things for a while. And that's something that I, you know, I feel like I'm pretty allergic to that because I've seen that happen in some places. And it, it really leaves a bad taste in everybody's mouth. Um, how how would you say this is a little different than that? Because I, I want to make sure when people hear this, they're not just like, oh, yeah, you know, here's two white guys just saying how they're going to mm -hmm. fix everything and send Bibles to these people who need them. I, 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 yeah, I think, I think you have something to say on that. Like, how is this different than that? So this particular organization we were working with, a Training to Send, and I'm going to put a big plug in for them. The way they are handling the relationship cross-cultural, the indigenous leadership, and how they're doing that, I was really impressed. I came back. I, I told the, I'm not sure what his title is, Joe Fleming. I told him, I said, what you're doing here, I, I am 100% in support of. Like, I saw them come alongside their local leadership and just bless them. Mm. And then also they were... They were supporting them in, in a way like not not a paternalistic method. Like they were not just over them. They were coming in behind them and supporting them from behind. Mm. Like a lot of the local leadership was doing the work and mm -hmm. doing the leading in it. They were casting vision. They were going out and starting new groups. And so I was really excited about that. Mm. But now to answer your question, like then what I saw for us is we can supply them with what they really need. It's something they are really not gonna be able to raise enough of funds to go buy a container load of Bibles at a reasonable cost. Mm -hmm. And it's really the only way you're gonna get them at a reasonable sum. And so they they simply were not gonna be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And so for us to come along and say, here, we can help with that piece. We'll never duplicate what they're doing mm -hmm. on the ground. Like it was just, it was phenomenal and what mm -hmm. they're doing with the church and the way the church was growing. But here we can come along and supply what they really need. And mm -hmm. I, that really, that to me felt different. Hmm. And I, hopefully that answers your question. It, yeah, it does. And that, that was a lot of the sense I got while I was there. It's a partnership. Yeah. Is what it, it was. Because we'd go to do these different churches, you know, and you'd, you know, maybe be speaking about, hey, you know, here's these Bibles. But it was, it was a strong sense of, 
this is a partnership all across the body of Christ. So for example, okay, there were a bunch of people in America, hey, that helped get funds. And then other people helped figure out the logistics. And then they were printed, what, I think in India, right? Yep. You know, shipped all the way over and brought into uh, Senegal. So different church, you know, group or a different group got them, you know, put them on a truck, drove them all the way. Like you had all these different elements of Christ's body working together, all those pieces mm -hmm. to get that box to with whatever that church may be to where the pastor himself can, okay, give yeah. them to the members of his church. And I thought uh, that, that struck me as, as I wish it wouldn't have surprised me as much as it did, but it feels like in, in a lot of things that I've been involved with, that feels pretty rare. It, yeah. I, I don't, it would have been interesting. I don't know if it would be possible, but to try to figure out how many different church groups or churches or pastors, whatever, were involved in the whole process from start to finish, yeah. but it would be a lot across many countries. And Sure, um, you know, you guys as an organization brought a, a critical component, but by no means the only component. Like no. you, you couldn't have done it by yourselves. Is that a fair And the assessment? distribution wouldn't have happened mm -hmm. correctly either without what they were doing there on the ground. Mm -hmm. Like the, those two pastors and, and the people that they represented, there was a lot of people with them as well. Mm -hmm. Like there's no way we could have distributed them effectively. Sure, we went to a few churches and we handed some out, but it was like, you know, this is not efficient. This is not a good way to do it. I mean, this looks good for for the moment, but and it feels good, but it really it's, is not the way to do it. So is this maybe, um, I guess, us putting out encouragement that uh, this partnership all across the body of Christ, all around the globe, whatever that may look like, feels like that is the critical component mm -hmm. instead of kind of like my original question, it's not the big... Americans with all the money coming in, just you know, like, well, we can, we can fix that. You know, how, yeah. how, what's the, give me, you know, what's, how big a check do we need to raise? You know, it, it felt very different than that. And I think that was one of the reasons I got excited because I, I would think everybody listening to this can get very excited about getting the Bible to as many people as possible around the world, right? That just mm -hmm. seems like something we would all agree on and be happy uh, to, to be a part of. But it gets really messy depending on how it's done. Yeah. Um, I think that's the piece that I want to make sure is clear, you know, that um, I think we all deeply care about God's word and getting it to, to everybody who wants it. Um, how we do it may be a bit of a challenge and difficult. Yeah. And that's where the whole, how do we avoid, you know, coming across as the big Western saviors that are going to take care of everything. And it's like, oh, I don't think we want to be like that. So, yeah. And that's the part where I'm saying it takes a lot of patience because you have mm -hmm. to go in, you have to find the structure that exists and how we can partner with it. Hmm. We were able to do some of that with Malawi. And there, there's pastor fraternities. There's these groups of pastors in local areas, like kind of village pastors get together. And some of them are registered. There's like an umbrella organization. And they do a bit of holding each other accountable. So we found a way to actually distribute and send them two or three boxes or however many boxes they would get, and they would take them and distribute them among themselves where the mm. need was. Mm. And so that was a way to hold accountability in that regard. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, a, it's actually a means, like we have to get there and we have to find out from the local leadership where are the needs and what's the best way to do this. And they usually know. And sometimes it, it takes a while. It takes a bit of conversation. In this case, Training to Send already had that for us. Mm -hmm. They already knew it. And they're like, yeah, here we go. This is mm -hmm. what we need. Yeah, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty powerful. And I think, again, that's just so neat to see the, the Church of Christ all uh, across however many different countries and communities coming together mm -hmm. around something like mm -hmm. this. I think that's, that's, that's pretty neat. You know, yeah. I'd like to see more of that. Um, so do you all think, um, you'll continue doing this type of thing? Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We have kind of planned for this next year, what we're going to do, um, uh, roughly sketched out and we're, we're actually not going to grow it by that much. We're going to continue to take time to, to go visit some of the areas where we haven't visited. There's a few places where we have sent container loads, uh, a couple years running now, but we haven't been there much. Mm -hmm. And so we want to get there. We want to check on it. Mm -hmm. When you're there, you get a little bit of a, a better idea mm -hmm. what what is reality. And so, yeah, that, that's cool. Yeah, that's, that, that is phenomenal. Um, yeah, so you were there for part of our trip, but not the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And the day you missed was Sunday. So Sunday morning, 
we went to a church. It was actually Pastor M, I'll call him. It was his home church. It was his home village is where we went. So it was really cool. We spent a, whole, a week with this guy, and he took us basically back home. Mm-hmm. And we saw where his brother, I'm trying to think, the pastor there I think was relative of his as well. And so we had a meal in the pastor's home, which was pretty much your West African meal. Yes. It was really That's good. wonderful. Yeah. Um, but while we were there, so we got there, and the people were standing outside. Church had already started, and church inside was full. And the, p- the reason people were outside is because it was full. Mm-hmm. And it was a it was a really a blessing to be there and to observe their entire service. So when we were done, uh, they had asked me to preach, and so I did. And when we were all said and done, um, they handed out the Bibles to the people that were sitting in the church. And it was not chaotic. Everybody stayed sitting and they handed them out. And then they said, we have some more and you can have one if you can read. And so they were at the back of the church. Mm. Uh, Pastor D was standing back there with a Bible and checking them if they could read. And I got some footage of it. He's back there. He's like, <laughs> read this. And he pushed one kid out of the way and got the next one. They read, all right. And he was doing that back, you know, they were, they were handing them out that way. Hmm. And it was actually, to me, it was like, well, I'm sure the Bible will get somewhere, you know. At one point, I was hmm. a Gideon. So that for them, you know, that Bible goes, even if it lands in the trash, it's good, you know. Somebody mm-hmm. will get it. Mm-hmm. And so, but they, they handed them out that way. But anyway, what I was going after is when it was all said and done, the pastor said, I want to thank you for coming. He said, now my whole church has a Bible. Hmm. I was like, wow. And while I was preaching... I didn't bother reading in English. Uh, Pastor M did. He he read it and he didn't read it in English. He read it in Creole, in their language. And I was able to watch where the Bibles were. They had a deep reverence for the Bible, mm-hmm. so they stood while we read, and things like that. And you could see where the Bibles were. Every Bible had about three heads to it, and I would say wow. ten to twenty percent of the congregation had a Bible. But you could tell where they weren't because they were all looking up and they were mm-hmm. paying attention. And just to know then, after we left, everybody can have one wow. next Sunday. So that was a that was a blessing. That was something that'll stick mm. with me after that trip. And maybe that's that's a piece that we really want to um, leave with the listeners is just what a blessing it is that each of us have. Mm-hmm. I mean, at least viewers here in America, and I'm guessing most most of the viewers here that see this uh, or listeners, we all have our own Bible. Yeah. I mean, just like. It's not something we really think about. Um, whereas in a place like that, I, wow, that would be a real challenge if 80% of your church didn't even have their own copy. Like that, that would be hard, you know? Yeah, and as a pastor, I would struggle with that because mm-hmm. when I'm preaching, I want you to follow. I want you to yeah. know what's going on. And I want you to point out if, wait a minute, you you got a problem here. <laughs> you know, I want you to be able to study it yourself. And mm-hmm. I just don't know how you would function like that. Yeah. And we have a... The quote in one of the videos that we took, uh, where Pastor M saying, yeah, they do. They do preach without, pastors preach without a Bible. Pastors are leading congregations without a copy of the word. Mm -hmm. That's scary. Mm -hmm. So so we've outlined some of this trip and some of the needs and also um, just the, how powerful it is. Now, how powerful the Bible is, anywhere it is Mm -hmm. around the world. Again, I think that is one one thing any any Christian anywhere, anytime could agree with that, like the Bible is foundational to so many elements of church and life and just everything. Um, so practically, after, you know, people who listen and watch this, what is something they can do? What are maybe some ways they can learn to, I don't know, like a, a appreciate the blessing it is to have a Bible that they can share uh, with other church groups, wherever it might be, that don't have uh, access to God's word? What's something you can leave with our listeners, something practical they can do right now. So the organization we were working with, Training to Send, they are accepting all English, they're accepting English Bibles to go to West Africa. Because a number of the Mm. countries there speak English. And if you have an English Bible that's in good shape, uh, don't send them something that's falling apart or is missing a piece, Mm -hmm. you know, obviously, but uh, they would accept them. So Mm. if your church is taking out all the pew Bibles and you know, or whatever, if you have some laying at home you're not using, 
uh, they would accept them. Maybe you could put that in the show notes. Mm, yeah. We have some like addresses. A, like a mail, mailing address. They have a, I think yeah. they have a warehouse, right? You they have just a warehouse. mail it there and then they'll put them in a shipping container and send them over I to I think the they do some sorting, but it's sort probably it. good yeah. if you sorted through yours before you sent them <laughs> just to make sure. <laughs> sure. Uh, but that sure. would be one practical way mm. uh, they, and they'll get them there. Um, the other thing is, yeah, there are many organizations that send Bibles to places and we're not the only ones. Please, I, there are others who are doing a good job of it too. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, find a way to support that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I don't know if there's some, just keeping in the center of, of our minds just how important God's word is mm -hmm. and again, how fantastic it is that we have access to it. You know, well, I guess the the thing there would be study it yourself. You know, mm -hmm. you have it. You have access to it. Spend time actually reading it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it, which is kind of surprising how when we have something, we take it for granted, and it's mm -hmm. you're actually at least for me, it feels less less likely to study it because like, well, I'll always be able to. Like I can, you know, it's easy to just kind of put it off. Yeah. I wonder how I would think about it if if I didn't. Let's say I'd been a Christian for five, 10 years, like some, some of these people that you were talking about and never had my own copy and be like, anytime you get access to it, you want to quick study as much as you could, you know? Yeah. And so I don't know how we can, I, I don't know really how to, to get that within myself of like that earnestness yeah. to always be wanting to study it more. There's, um, but that, that was convicting for me, honestly, right. you know? We had, there's some of those people would get the Bible and they would be like, they were at page one and they were just, you could tell that the world had stopped all around them. Mm -hmm. And that was the only thing they were doing is just reading what was right in front of them. I, I actually wonder how many books they have in their language. Like, I don't think there's a lot to actually yeah. read, period. I mean, f yeah, Portuguese Creole, I mean, that's not a very widely spoken language I, at all, I right? I think, mean, it, I didn't actually look it up on Ethnologue. It um, can't be that much. You know, you know like, what the use is of it. Mm -hmm. But to have that and be able to read it right there, mm -hmm. you could tell that they were just drawn in. Mm -hmm. like, wow, I'm reading this. Mm -hmm. That was incredible to watch. So hopefully that's an inspiration for people listening to try to try to get back to that spark of the the joy of studying God's word and how mm -hmm. much richness is is in there. Mm -hmm. Actually, um, we were just interviewing someone else on on the story, the grand story of of the Bible, the storyline of Scripture, mm -hmm. and and he was just kind of walking through some of the big themes and threads throughout the Bible, and it was just like, wow, this is so neat, you know. And I can just sit down and read this at any time and and learn this, but then you take it for granted and you don't and. Uh, and all that, but it, it, hearing constantly hearing things like that, encouraging mm -hmm. my own self to, um, uh, yeah, to study this, you know, and and really learn. So yeah, yeah. So we've been talking about the Bibles specifically and God's Word around the world, and um, and how phenomenal it is that we have our own copies. But something else y'all do as as a, a ministry is uh, radio broadcasts into a lot of different places. So. Um, and we don't need to get into tons of detail, but I remember hearing this, you know, at least especially before I knew you and just thinking, well, isn't radio dead? Like mm -hmm. nobody listens to the radio anymore, right? Um, so you want to talk a little bit about that, like the teaching uh, and, and again, getting God's message out into the world and what that looks yeah. like through radio. So Harold's Hope's vision is to use media to make disciples of Jesus Christ to accomplish a great commission in our lifetime. Hmm. It's a little bit of a mouthful, but the idea is we use media, whether it's print, internet, radio, well, that's our vision. And we specifically hone in on expository Bible teaching and actually looking at Scripture and teaching out of the Scripture, not teaching into it or teaching our own ideas, but what does this say in coming out of that? And yes, there is an aspect of where radio is dead. Well, I drove three and a half hours and we didn't turn the radio on. That's not because I'm against it. I just... I don't listen to the radio. <laughs> but there is a segment of the population that does. So that's one thing. In, in the, I'm talking in the U.S., there is, there's still listeners to radio because it's free. You can easily get it. It's local. Mm -hmm. um, but internationally, there's an element of where that is still the main medium for people to consume information. So mm -hmm. you get into some places like Afghanistan and especially rural areas, that's a source of lifeblood. And parts of Africa, that is key. Like there's definitely a lot of listeners to some of those mm -hmm. stations and even shortwave. Here, we don't know what shortwave is, but there's there's parts of the world where that's, those are still critical infrastructures. 
that exist and and reach into places that are incredible, like way back in. Um, but that being said, there's no doubt cell phones, internets. We were, you know, in some of those villages, and I turn around and there's a cell phone tower right <laughs> yeah, in the middle we of were mud the- huts <laughs> and no electricity. <laughs> yeah, and- I mean, we had been off pavement for like two hours, you know, on these dirt tracks, you know, and then boom, cell phone yeah. tower. <laughs> yep, yeah, there's a cell phone tower. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so th- there's definitely a change happening mm-hmm. uh, around the world, and cell phones are becoming the norm. Everybody has one. But I did notice out there that their phones weren't necessarily this, they weren't smartphones. Yeah. They were like multifunction devices. Some of them had serious flashlights and solar panels on them. And yeah. I actually wanted to get my hands on one because they looked kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. But that's, that's still, so there's some, there's some disparity there. One of the things that Training Descent is doing, and we're, talking with them about is actually distributing SD cards that you can put in like a phone or a player oh, and, and be able to do that and listen to the scripture like actually an, discreetly. Like an audio Bible, yeah. basically. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's really neat. Yeah. yeah. And so the one thing with that is it's, it's discreet. Mm-hmm. Some places you go to, I mean, carrying a book around that says Bible on the front will get you in some trouble. Mm-hmm. Whereas having an SD card in your phone that you're listening to something on, on ear pods or something, um, yeah, it's not quite as mm-hmm. obvious. So that's part of it. Um, well, so, so what's your, so what, what you're outlining here, um, really just, if, if maybe I'm, yeah, make sure I'm tracking with you. Right. But basically whatever means we can to get God's yeah. word and teaching about God's word to as many places as we can, like to people who don't have access to it. So you're mentioning yep. some of these places where, you know, radio may still be the best way. Mm-hmm to get this message into people. Right. Whereas another place, hey, SD card, another place, a print Bible, another place, internet, whatever. I, I think that's an important piece where it's like yeah. the tools aren't necessarily what matter here. It's like, this is a, a critical message that here in America, we have un, basically unlimited access to God's word and teaching about God's word, whereas a lot of places don't. So if I'm understanding right, you guys are basically saying, well, let's let's make sure we get it to, to those places too. Yeah. And our thing is simple. It, it's simple mm-hmm. teaching. It's not a complicated doctoral dissertation on on something. It's it's simple, easy, accessible teaching mm. as, is what we aim for. And yeah, we definitely do broadcast quite a bit around the world. We're in 26 languages. Language number 27, we're hoping to get on the air here soon mm-hmm. in Zambia. Um, so out of our whole Bible fiasco in Zambia, we ended up with a broadcast. Oh, wow. I don't know that that would have happened without having that connection to it. So it's kind of unique. So it kind of comes back to like, again, it's not necessarily the tools that matter. So in that case, you're trying to do print Bibles, but okay, maybe that didn't work, but wait, Hey, we can still get this message out through radio say. And they were excited about that. That's really neat. Because they're lacking good teaching Mm. on that language. And so having translated and not just translated, but culturally translated as well. So we do give the translators leeway to make cultural adaptations to the message as well Mm. so that it applies. Uh, We're also working on Dari for Afghanistan right now and Bengali. There's two that I'm working on. And when I say working on them, it goes and fits and starts. We we get wow. somewhere and then it sits for a bit until the next piece comes along. And yeah, but that's phenomenal where, again, it's just this concept of there are very large parts of the world, many, many big chunks of the globe that just aren't getting scripture or scriptural teaching mm-hmm. or Bibles or whatever it might be. Um, that's, I think, I, I really want the, our listeners keep that in mind as they go, go away from this episode is just that that disparity and, like, we can do something about that, too. Mm-hmm. Like, I think if the church, again, the global church, working together in partnership, like, working together in these places can can help bring, you know, bring these messages to those places. Yeah, so I see our role as Heralds of Hope as being a tool. Mm-hmm. So we're never going to replace the boots on the ground. And one of our broadcasts is the Hausa language, which is uh, training to send has a number of people in Niger and Nigeria. There's a, the, a large people group, uh, mostly farmers. And there, if you see that name in the news, it's because of the conflict between the Fulani and the Hausa people. Mm-hmm. They, they don't get along real well. But the church, I understand, is exploding in that region. It's growing incredibly. We get more responses from that broadcast than anything combined. And Whoa. we've had, 
we've had an average of uh, four to five decisions for Christ per broadcast. Wow. On that, on, some, on for a while. Now, it's not been consistent. There's been some fluctuation to that, depending on what they're broadcasting and what they're teaching through. But there's an incredible broadcast, or incredible response coming back from that broadcast. Mm. And we look at that and we're like, are those numbers right? Mm. And then it does seem like they're correct. And people are, people are hearing it, but there's something else happening. The church is really growing in that area as well. Wow. And so I see... I see what we do as a tool. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like your hammer, your screwdriver. It's a tool for a particular job. Mm -hmm. It can help feed the church out there that just needs some additional food. Uh, it doesn't replace the congregation. It doesn't replace what you do with church and, and Bible study and everything, but it's, it's an additional piece. And it's the same way with the Bibles. We come along with a container load of Bibles to meet a particular need mm -hmm. in that area. Our dream would be to work them to a place where they could place their own orders. Yeah. And that's yeah, something we didn't even talk about. Yeah. We're, we're starting to make that shift in Malawi. It's, it's slow. And I'm hoping that we can get local believers on board who can actually help make that happen. Mm -hmm. And just this last shipment that went in, we didn't pay any local distribution costs. Like the transportation between different cities, they moved part of the container load from, I think it was like three, total of three cities where it's kind of scattered. And we didn't pay that. They did. Mm. They Somebody came along and said, I can do that. Mm -hmm. I can help with this. And so we're, we're trying to make that shift. And someday, I'd hope to hear that container loads or uh, Bibles are going to Malawi and we didn't do anything. Yeah, that's wow, that's neat. We can move on to the next yeah. country. Yeah. Yeah. That would be the dream. But as all dreams, it takes a while sometimes. <laughs> so there's yeah, I think there's there's a lot to to think about out of this episode. Um the the lack of of God's word around the world and how that is still very real today and how there are church groups and different organizations and people that are working on this mm -hmm. and I think that's phenomenal and and hopefully out of this uh, episode, you know, some of the, our listeners are like, oh, wow, like that's something I, I care about that. Mm -hmm. I really care about that. I want to get involved. Um, I want to, I want to help. And, and that's, that's, I think really important is this, that awareness of we have such a blessing here and how can we partner with the church around the world, wherever it might be, mm -hmm. who, who, mm -hmm. you know, that we can, we can help. So, uh, or, or come alongside, um, and empower. So. And that's one of the things we say is we would like to be a tool mm -hmm. that you can use to reach the world. And I, you know, doing that from home or from where you're at. And so to be an avenue or a channel for that, where your church can help reach a community or a, a place that they have a passion about and be able to, to share the gospel, share the Bibles, and maybe even be an avenue to go visit and build relationships as well. Yeah. So we're yeah. still working on some of those things and connecting the dots to that. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, that was the last question I had on my list, but is there anything else you'd like to add as we bring this episode to a close? If there's anything from this episode, what I would like the most is if people could go with a passion to share the gospel. Mm. The, you know, the refugees are moving around the world at an unprecedented rate. We have people all over in our cities that come from all over the world. Mm. You know, go reach them. Go share the gospel with them. There are tools out there that you can go across language barriers and be able to share the gospel with them. Find those tools and go be an active hmm. uh, witness for the gospel. If anything else, that's what I would love to see happen. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to share about this. I think that's a that's an excellent note to end on. Go out there and, and show Jesus to someone. Bring God's word to different places around the world. So. That's phenomenal. Thanks so much for sharing today. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Anabaptist Perspectives. If you found this interesting, you may enjoy the episodes we did with Amada Thomas, who's a pastor from Kenya. As always, you can find all our content on our website at anabaptistperspectives.org. Thanks again, and we will catch you in the next episode. Mm -hmm.